Good morning, everyone. How are you all? It is stunning out there, which is such a magnificent thing different than yesterday, <laughs> when we all went, right, North Shore fall. <laughs> uh, delightful to be here with you this morning in this mid-September day. Lovely to see so many familiar faces and a few new or newish faces, new again faces. Really lovely to see you all. Um, here we are at the North Shore Unitarians, service number two of the season. Very excited about that. Uh, we're revving up for another wonderful year together. Here, of course, it is our collective mission to empower people to live with greater depth, meaning, and purpose. Here, we're constantly building connections within our community and beyond, supporting one another, challenging one another, challenging ourselves to be the best that we can be. And as Ram Das says, ultimately, we're walking each other home. Can you hear me okay? Mumbled, no. There were some questions about sound last week. We're good. See Barry, sound guy. Give him the thumbs up or the louder if we need. Yeah, okay, good. Whew. I'm particularly grateful for this community today because I'm finding the world feeling really overwhelming right now. I don't know about you, but there are two world wars that just have gone on and on, and there's a continued war of words that seems to happen in pockets everywhere, some of them quite aggressive and violent, some of it around identity politics, some of it other things. The ice caps are melting like the list goes on. You didn't come here this morning to hear a miserable maudlin list, but we all know that this is a challenging world we live in. And so I have days when hopelessness licks at my toes like a slow-burning flame, and I think defiantly I'm going to walk forwards, but it's hard, and I seek something, something to quell that sense of overwhelm, some one simple thing that will make me feel better. Maybe that's a new book, uh, a new meditation, uh, a five-year plan, uh, a change of diet. I'm sure getting rid of gluten is going to fix me completely. Uh, a cool new meditation, a gratitude app. Maybe I need a life coach, <laughs> or maybe I'll just have another glass of wine, <laughs> or a donut. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> That's community, Liz. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, I just want one thing that will quell my sense of fear and anxiety and worry, those negative feelings that wake us up at three in the morning and buzz in our head and our hearts. I have a friend who calls them the bees. The bees woke her up this morning. Why is it we never wake up at 3 a.m. feeling joy? Like, why is that? We don't. It's always negative. Um, but I have yet to find that instant fix for this feeling that overwhelms me. Of course, anxiety about the world is not new, right? Wars have happened since the beginning of time. There's always been pandemics and natural, natural disasters and destruction and fake news and family troubles and illness. And all human beings that have ever lived reach a point in their life, be it 50 or 70 or 90, when our metabolism slows and our bodies begin to weaken. That has happened always since the beginning of time. But still, for each one of us, when one of those things happen, big or small, it's easy to get overwhelmed things that affect our life, our health, our family, our wealth, our happiness. They can rock our world, and we begin to feel afraid. It's all very real, and none of it, or almost none of it, is in our control. But of course, there is like a billion dollars of industry out there, the spirituality and wellness industry, that says, trying desperately to convince us we can make this within our control, that we can manifest any and everything we really want to happen in the world if we just believe in the right power of positive thinking, or make the right lifestyle change, or believe in the right higher power. Those ideas are all over our world today with like millions of people bought in. And I get it, like there's huge appeal to trying to fix that sense of despair and powerlessness. But I don't know about you, I don't see it working very well. What I do realize is that friendships and kinships like the ones that we forge through this community, that is the strongest balm that I have to that sense of despair. Coming and meeting on Sundays, feeling heard, being seen, <clears throat> for us recognizing the way our family is held in the tender palm of this community, that is the way I get through. That reminds me of who I am. It reminds all of us who we are when we're here. Because here, we are held to be the best we can be, who we can aspire to be when we're at our best, 
and here we are still held when we're mm, at our worst. Every one of us finds life hard in our own ways. Things happen that rock our world. They don't have to harm our soul. Things can bring suffering, but they don't have to bring us hopelessness and despair. These days, in this crazy world, they're some of the hardest we will live through. The wind is blowing hard, but because we have each other, we have hope. Herein begins our service this morning on hope. Our first song this morning is a beautiful one. It contains lyrics with the word you. And so traditionally, with our you, you values, whatever you want you to be, maybe it means your partner or your family or the spirit of a loved one you've buried, or maybe it means your inner strength or your soul, or maybe it means a higher power, or maybe it means our community. Whatever you is a positive life force for you that brings you hope and sol solace, please let that be the you you see in the words today. Let us stand together and sing, When I Am Frightened, number 1012. Show me compassion and I'll learn to care. Show me acceptance and I'll learn to give. Show me commitment and I'll learn to love. They're beautiful, powerful words. We start our time together every week with the lighting of the chalice. This marks our time together as special or reverent. Some UU communities call Sunday services worship, which means focusing on what we call or consider worthy. I've asked Claude Jiguer to come up and light our candles this morning. Claude is new to our community, I think came late last year, um, and he is the section lead for the bases now. That's wonderful, Claude. <laughs> um, I've actually known Claude for many years. He's an incredibly talented musician and musical teacher, and he actually started the North Shore Celtic Ensemble. Yeah, pretty amazing. Um, you knew Annabelle very well over the years. 
yes, growing. Uh, Annabelle played the flute with the ensemble also. Anyways, it's a great joy to have you here, Claude, so thank you. So we light our chalice. It's uh, a physical and metaphorical flame to remind us of the light and warmth that we find in community. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. May the light of understanding illuminate our darkness. May the warmth of sharing bring us peace. Beautiful. And as always, we light two other candles in this weekly ritual. The first is for joys and sorrows. There are a number of people in our community for whom there is some, some struggle or some sorrow. They, we won't name them, but just take a moment to keep them in your thoughts. And the other group that we're sending a bit of love out into the universe is there are a bunch of grandkids and a few kids who are out there starting post-secondary education, college or university. <clears throat> And uh, so we send them our best. That's definitely a big, challenging life phase, and a few of them we've known well in our community, so we send them some good love this morning. And lastly, our candle of global concern. This week, week I think of um, a little story and a saying that I heard spoken at a peace protest. Actually, um, there was a, a rabbi, Sharon Bruce, and she joined a protest. It was a pro-Palestinian encampment, and she joined along with, there was, of course, both factions, and she tells the story of how she joined with the People of Purple. I don't know if you know that organization, but their goal is to bring peace in the bigger sense, but also to conflicts when there's protests and things happening. And um, so Rabbi Sharon Bruce uh, joined them, and they walked down the line. They walked down the line of the, you know, the fired up factions of people, and they started a chant, and this is what they said, so simple. From Gaza to Tel Aviv, all children deserve to live. That's it. From Gaza to Tel Aviv, all children deserve to live. So as part of our candle of global concerns, I think we could expand that to be a little bit more local and even more international. And we might say something like, from the downtown east side to Kiev in Ukraine, from Gaza to Tel Aviv, all children, all people deserve to live. Thank you, Claude. We gather today in this beautiful building in the lovely woods of the North Shore on the ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, primarily the Squamish people. We all appreciate the beauty and the reverence for this land, and we endeavor to walk forwards with a more beautiful relationship with both the land and all people who live here. So this morning, our topic, our service, is about hope. That's a rather broad topic. <laughs> And I wanted to share where the inspiration for some of that came from. Uh, as you know, our Sunday services team met at the end of June to plan the year. And at the time, I was deeply immersed in reading these three books by Father Greg Doyle. Uh, humbling, inspiring, grounding. Father Boyle, or G, as he's often called, he's a Jesuit priest. I find it interesting he doesn't list that on the front of his book. It doesn't even say Father, it's just Gregory Boyle. It's actually listed on the back. Um, he is perhaps the most liberal thinking, devout Catholic I've ever met. I think in 2024, that is no longer an oxymoron, liberal thinking, devout Catholic. Um, I actually think he, he embodies a lot of UU values, which would make him a Jesuit priest, <laughs> just saying. He's the founder and director of an organization called Homeboy Industries, and it's the world's largest gang intervention and rehab program. It's amazing. It's been going since 1992, and it has a, a significantly um, proven track record, better, better than any other kind of program known in the world. Um, and it runs out of Los Angeles. So in learning about his work through his books, and admittedly, a few YouTube videos and podcasts. The internet's an amazing thing, <laughs> but you can also go way down the rabbit hole. I, I learned a lot about gang life, and even better, through his books and his stories, he wove in the heartwarming and heart-wrenching stories of the homies, as the gang members are affectionately called. And Father Greg says, you know, people think that these kids join gangs because they're drawn, they're attracted, they're pulled, they're seeking something but the truth is they're fleeing something. They're fleeing the damage and enormous trauma that was inflicted on them, primarily from their families of origin. And they're probably also fleeing some mental health issues. And Greg says, when you recognize that they're fleeing, and that's a key kind of diagnostic moment, you recognize then that what they're fleeing is despair. 
He says, too many kids in my community plan their funerals, plan their funerals, and not their futures. They can't imagine and conjure up any image of what tomorrow looks like, and therefore their present is not compelling enough to hold them there. And consequently, sometimes they just don't even care whether they inflict harm or get harmed. They don't care whether they even duck to get out of harm's way. He says gang violence is a language, and it's the language of a lethal absence of hope. A lethal absence of hope. That phrase has just rung around in my head ever since. And Father Greg goes on to say that if these kids have a lethal absence of hope, then the only way forwards is not incarceration, it's to build relationships and community and infuse hope to these kids for whom hope was foreign. And that's the way into healing trauma and delivering mental health services. That's what we need to do. So Homeboy Industries, it does give them jobs, it gives them drug rehab, it does tattoo removal, but most importantly, it gives them love, relationships, a healthy community, and a sense of hope. Father Boyle talks about muscular hope. I kind of love that expression, muscular hope. Thomas Merton writes, we must become the fire of a wild white sun, eating up the distance between hope and despair. And Father Greg reminds us that is our task, not just for all those of us who have privilege, but for every one of us in the world, however we can, it's our job to eat up the distance between hope and despair. Vox Lumina will now share a beautiful piece called Take Down These Walls that describes so well what Father Greg and Homeboy Industries do so well.
by Vaclav Havel. Do you remember that name? So Vaclav Havel was the uh, president of Czechoslovakia. He was the last president of Czechoslovakia before it became the Czech Republic, and he was the first president of the Czech Republic. He was a writer, a political activist, spent time in, uh, as a political prisoner. And in his 1986 work, Disturbing the Peace, he wrote, hope is a state of mind, not of the world. Either we have hope or we don't. It's a dimension of the soul, and it's not essentially dependent on some particular observation of the world or an estimate of the situation. It's not a prognostication. It's an orientation of the spirit, of the heart. It transcends the world that's immediately experienced and is anchored somewhere beyond its horizons. Hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy that things are going well or a willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for success but rather it's an ability to work for something just because it's good, not just because it stands a chance to succeed. In fact, the more propitious a situation in which we demonstrate hope, the deeper that hope is. And hope is not the same thing as optimism. It's not the conviction that something will turn out well, but rather the faith that we can somehow make sense of it somehow, regardless of how it turns out. UU minister Reverend Robert Hardy's, he agrees. He says, hope is not given or delivered. In order to be hopeful, people must work at it. We have to make it a lifelong endeavor, an intentional practice. Hope is a bit like love that way. It's not a once and for all cure. It's just one of the most important ongoing spiritual projects of our lives. It's a journey, a difficult path this, through this broken and beautiful world. And naturally, we move through phases in our life of more hope and more despair. Rabbi Sharon Bruce describes hope like the moon. It goes in phases, sometimes more present and less present at different moments in time. She also says that we're the most hopeless when we stand with the shortest vision of things, when we are the most myopic about what's going on, when we can't see the bigger picture. In fact, some would say that right now we don't have the language for dreaming about a really different and better future because we're so stuck in the awful here and now. You actually need to lift your gaze and start to think differently. And she tells a story. It comes from the Torah. So Moses is going up on the mount when his people were in battle. They'd been um, attacked. And the story goes that on the top, Moses raised his arms. And when his arms were up, his people prevailed. But the battle went on, and Moses got tired, and his arms started to sink. And the people started to be defeated. So two men, Aaron and Hur, they went up, and they held Moses' arms up. And then the people started to win again. And the rabbis who were there to witness all of this, they said, what is this? Is this magic? Is this God? And someone said, no. When his arms are up, it gives people something to look up at, something to hold on to, something other than the street battle right in front of them. It gives them something to believe in, something to hope for. Despite our anxieties, as a people of faith, we can still dare to get our hopes up. I think that's a beautiful story. Of course, hope gets us through difficult times. It helps us to get up in the morning. It enables us, as Desmond Tutu said, to see that there is light despite all the darkness. And Martin Luther King, he compelled us to accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. I want to share with you an experience I had just a couple weeks ago. I found myself waiting recurrently at three in the morning, <clears throat> multiple nights. And I was overwhelmed with a situation. It was something I found quite deeply disturbing and upsetting. And on the fourth night, when I woke again at three in the morning, I finally had to admit to myself that if this was not just jet lag. Um, and I wasn't feeling just a little bit hopeless. You know, if Rabbi Sharon Bruce says that hope is like the moon, this was like an eclipse, like no little sliver of hope. <clears throat> And somehow then I sunk even deeper into the feeling of despair, and I just felt this so acutely and tightly in my chest, feeling overwhelmed, and that was compa uh, compounded by the fact that this was the fourth night in a row, and my mood can really sink if I don't get good sleep, and so that made me even worse. And I lay there. I knew exactly what I was thinking about, what was upsetting me, and that just made it feel even bigger in my chest. And the word that kept coming back to me was hopeless. I was feeling hopeless. And for once in that moment, I kind of stopped replaying in my mind the content, you know, the what, and I just stuck with the feeling. 
I stopped thinking about what was said and how I responded and maybe what I should do and I just let that go and I just sat there with this football-sized sense of hopelessness and I realized how strongly it was burning inside my chest and somehow the words that came to me in the moment was how tightly I was holding on to it. And I was like, wait a minute, what? I'm holding on to it? And you know, all of this is happening with that hazy 3 a.m. bleary-eyed, I'm not even sure if I'm awake or drifting off to sleep in between moments and thoughts. But through that, it just kind of piqued this little curiosity that, okay, well, if I'm holding on to this feeling, maybe it would burn a little less if I just tried to loosen my grip. Those are the words that came to my brain, loosen my grip. Because I was not ready to let go, that seemed huge. So just loosen my grip. All right, I'm gonna take a pause and just say, I'm really not this hokey pokey most of the time. <laughs> and if I was sitting there in a chair and listening to the story, I might even roll my eyes, inwardly if not outwardly. <laughs> like, I'm not the girl who believes a lot in tarot cards or chakras or stuff. I mean, not to say that they might have a place in the world or be connected to the universe, but that's just, I'm not all into that stuff. So this is really not me, this story I'm telling you. But when this happened in my head at 3.54 a.m., and I intentionally just decided to loosen my grip on that feeling. It was so weird, it was amazing. It was like something shifted. But it shifted in a way that lying there at 3.56 a.m., I just felt like the tightness was maybe a little less burning. In fact, it felt like it wasn't inside my chest anymore, but right on the outside. It had just shifted like an inch, but it was a marked difference. And I really can't explain it in any other words than that. But I do know I fell asleep again, and the next morning when I woke up, I felt a little less despair. And so I share that with you because sometimes I think our bodies do us a disservice, our minds, our hearts, our bodies. We get stuck in the quagmire of something. And if we can just try and let go of it a little bit, let a little bit of the hopelessness just step away a tiny bit, hold it a little less tightly, then I think that's how we make space for hope. We just make space for hope. And then, not ironically, a couple days later, I came across this piece by Thich Nhat Hanh, who, of course, you know is the well-known Buddhist world leader. These are words from his book, Peace is Every Step, and it made me stop and think. He often has a very different take on things. He said, Western civilization places so much emphasis on the idea of hope that we sacrifice the present moment. Hope is for the future. It can't help us discover joy and peace and enlightenment right here in the present. That's not to say we shouldn't have hope, but that hope is not enough. Hope creates an obstacle for us. If we dwell, dwell too much in the energy of hope, we can't bring ourselves right back to the here and now, to the present moment. And if instead we channel some of that energy into being aware of what's happening right here and now in the present, we might be able to make a breakthrough and discover the joy and peace right here inside of ourselves and around us. I think that's quite remarkable. So I'll invite you into a time of quiet. Some of you might appreciate this as a time of meditation. A few of you might think of it as prayer and others will be happy to take it as a moment of reflection. If you choose to meditate, settle in and let your mind go. If you're feeling cognitive, then perhaps you can reflect on something that makes you feel hopeful or something you hope for yourself or for the world. And if there's some of you who are feeling maybe a little less optimistic or your mood has got you down, I hear you. I invite you just to sit in the emotion of what you're feeling. You're not alone. I invite you just to feel the emotion, turn off the content and just let that see and observe what happens when you just watch it. What do you hope for? What gives you hope? And what are you feeling hopeless about? Allison will create some sound in the background and I invite you into two minutes of quiet. And as we end, Vox Lumina will bring us out of this quiet time with a beautiful anthem, Hope Lingers On.
Writer Maria Popova in her reflection, Hope, Cynicism, and the Stories We Tell Ourselves. She wrote, to live with sincerity in our culture of cynicism is a difficult dance. One that comes easily, mm, I might tweak that to easier, to the very young and the very old. The rest of us are left to tussle with two very polarizing forces that rip the psyche asunder by beckoning from opposite directions, critical thinking and hope. Critical thinking without hope is cynicism. Hope without critical thinking is naivete. And then there's the well-known passage by Howard Zinn, to be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It's based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also compassion, sacrifice, courage, and kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. But if we remember those times and places, and there are many where people have behaved magnificently, that gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world into a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future because the future is an infinite succession of presence. And to live now as we think human beings really should live in defiance of all that seems bad, that in itself is a marvelous victory. Our outreach recipient this morning is the Edible Garden Project. It operates Lutet Farms here on the North Shore. It operates a schoolyard market garden at Sutherland and five volunteer-driven sharing gardens at different sites across the North Shore. The Edible Garden Project grows and harvests fresh vegetables, partnering with local food security organizations to distribute them to those most in need in our community. They also offer a number of workshops encouraging people to just grow their own food. Unless you mark otherwise in, on your offering envelope, today's uh, collection will all go to the Edible Garden Project. And North Shore Unitarians joins the 21st Century Technology. You can now, if you get out your phone, you can text a donation or you can actually use that QR code and it'll actually direct you link. Anyone has any difficulties, Chris Miller and I might be able to help you with that after the service. Please give as generously as you're able. Will the ushers please come forward? We have a few announcements this morning. The first is please join us downstairs after the service for a delicious sandwich lunch. Diane has again prepared a marvelous feast for us all. Suggested donation is $5. And there is a welcome table for anyone who's new or new-ish. Uh, there's a table with a white uh, tablecloth and that's a welcoming spot for newcomers if you're feeling a little bit like not sure where to go. Next week's service is titled The Things We Do for Love, and we are delighted that the Reverend Sean Gauthier will be joining us. Sean is the new minister at UCV, Vancouver Unitarians, now rebranded to Van U. Um, that's their new branding. And uh, it's just lovely that Sean is, is coming to join the North Shore uh, Unitarians for a service so early in his season. Allison's offering ukulele classes on Thursdays from 6.30 to 7, right before uh, choir practice. It actually started this week, but you're welcome to join still. Uh, all ages, all abilities, or no ability. Uh, and you do need to bring a ukulele. An important date to keep in mind, October 6th, after the service and after lunch, we'll have a town hall meeting. It's an opportunity for us to gather and just talk about where we're going in the future. I think a future that looks mighty hopeful, I have to add. And lastly, there's an exciting fun fest event 
uh, Barry and Sue are planning in, on October 18th called Bunko. It's a very simple game. They've played it with our community before and other groups of people. It's apparently very simple, not hard to learn, and it creates a lot of joy and laughter and fun. So there's still space if you're interested, you can sign up. Uh, the board has been working on a new thought with some of these events, and this is the first that we run Fun Fest less fund fest, but that we actually rebrand all of that as fun fest. So, so just some events for all of us to have fun together. So are there any other announcements from anyone? Excellent. Okay. Um, Anglican priest Tish Warren wrote, hope is a waiting virtue. The human body, when immersed in darkness, our vision adapts. Our pupils dilate to let in more light. The darkness around us hasn't changed, but a change in us allows us to take in more things in the darkness. So Tish Warren says, hope is like the pupil dilation of the soul. When things are dark or broken, hope allows us to take in more things in that darkness. Hope is not naivete. Naivete is denial of the darkness. It's a false optimism, it's untruthful. Hope can't be untruthful. We only have hope, or we can only offer hope to others when we're plainly, frankly, openly honest about how dark things are. It's especially true when things are beyond our control. That's when hope gets our, its wings. She also says that hope is to borrow grace. To hope is to borrow grace. And I love that thought. Hope admits the truth of our vulnerability, and it doesn't just trust that life or the world or a God is gonna keep bad things from happening, but instead it assumes that there's a beauty and a goodness that will be there for us whatever lies ahead. We must do what we can all do. We must do what we can to bring hope in the world, however we're able. Billy Bragg is a folk singer. Folks know Billy Bragg? Anyone, a few, yes. He's 66 years old, just to give us the era. Um, he's an oldie and a goodie. I just saw Jell's eyes light up because it's his favorite singer, Billy Bragg. Um, he's a man who has made a living out of blending music and activism. He turns protest songs into albums and he puts, political, sorry, puts politics at the core of his artistic career. Um, he's actually playing at the Commodore this Friday night, if you're interested, and there are still tickets available. I'm not like an agent for him or anything, but. Um, <laughs> So Billy believes that the power and the currency of music is empathy. He says you're trying to get the listener to feel something for a situation that they themselves might not have experienced. And by and large, he says, I try and write songs that offer people hope, something positive. There's nothing worse than giving in to your own cynicism, he says. That, to me, is the great enemy of all of us who want to make this world a better place. And Billy is often asked, do you really think your music can change the world? Billy, do you really think your music can change the world? And which, to which he answers, of course not, but it doesn't stop me trying. That's courageous hope. So in honor of Billy Bragg's lifetime efforts of singing and encouraging hope and empathy, let us rise as we're able and sing together, come sing a song for me, number 346. <laughs> Oh! 
a rose in the winter time. And it's fall in North Vancouver. We're going to be singing in the rain for sure. So beautiful. So let's close our service together. We extinguish this flame, but carry with us the light of vision and the warmth of love. The world calls us to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. We go forth with courage and love. Step into the center, Marta Valentin invites us. Come in from the margins, I'll hold you there. Don't look back or around, just feel my arms. The water is rising, but I'll hold you as you tremble. I'll warm you. That's the blessing of radiant hope that lives in each one of us, that we can offer one another. We are each other's agents of awakening. In the tiny space where I end and you begin, Marta says, hope lives. I'll bring you hope when hope is hard to find. Hope is that lifeline we carry, the possibility that we see in ourselves and others, the grace we extend and receive. Theologian Paul Waddell calls this being each other's partners in hope. So whatever lies ahead for you in your week in our world, hope lives in this house. In the tiny space where I end and you begin, hope lives. Let us be each other's partners in hope. Amen. Shalom and blessed be. Please rise as you're able, join hands, and let's sing together, circle round. Sir. Sure.